The psychologist John Gray, author of Men Are From Mars and Women Are From Venus, once said that energy levels in men and women are driven by different hormones. In women, their emotional well-being and stress coping is largely driven by oxytocin, the bonding or love hormone as it's called. In men, it's driven like most things by testosterone. Oxytocin is replenished through cuddling and talking, while testosterone is replenished through rest and sleep. Gray suggested that one reason for marital conflict is the lack of understanding each spouse partner has for the recovery needs of the other, at times of high stress and correspondingly low well-being hormones. He goes on to suggest that this is why, after sex, women usually want to cuddle and chat, while men want to roll over and just go to sleep. Exploring this idea further, perhaps this is one reason why men find quiet pursuits such as fishing pleasurable, and why a group of men can sit for hours on end staring silently into a campfire without saying a word, seemingly hypnotised by the flicker of flames. It might also explain why a man can passively stare at a television screen, yet not pay attention to what is on, or occasionally sit glazed over like a zombie in what's humorously been described as our nothing box. I'll put a link in the description below to some of these videos. It's also been observed by psychologists that men communicate shoulder to shoulder, while women communicate face to face. That is to say, Men don't naturally just sit across from one another intentionally and chat, but rather they communicate while performing a task together. The communication often meandering from lads banter to more profound subjects and then back to banter again. Perhaps this is an evolutionary mechanism to prevent socially elevating levels of drama and tension and aid in cooperative behavior. Given the modern fragmentation of our families, communities and society generally, men are finding themselves increasingly cut off from each other as lengthy and complex labour tasks, traditionally performed in groups of men coming together, are now subject to automation, industrialization, and hired professionals. Young men no longer labour under the direction and guidance of their fathers, their uncles, grandfathers or master tradesmen, while these older men increasingly feel their own rapid irrelevance in a tech-driven, celebrity-influenced world where FaceTiming on a phone is entirely antithetical to a man's natural inclination and communication needs. So it's vitally important for men to set aside some time to be around both younger and older men to learn as well as to teach and to participate in pastimes that allow them the space to communicate in ways that are natural to them, as well as recover their physical and mental well-being. My dad and I are both avid fishermen. Dad taught me to fish and to shoot almost as soon as I could walk. Some of my earliest memories are of the open countryside, in gumboots, with rod in hand on the bank of a lake or stream and lines in the water. Many years later, I found the quiet concentration and solitude of fishing was an irreplaceable tonic during the emotional disaster of my divorce, and many poignant chats were had with Dad during that time, as we stood shoulder to shoulder, eyes on the tips of our fishing rods. Looking back at the value of it, I determined to make more time to spend with my Dad, as I suspect he gained as much from the giving of advice as I did in the reception of it. Neither of us had seriously tried fly fishing before, and the idyllic images I had seen of lone fly fishermen, thigh deep in fast flowing streams, flicking and whipping what looked like twine onto the surface of the water, stayed with me as a bucket list item to try someday. It turns out that in the snowy mountains of southeast Australia, there are a number of lakes and streams that had long been stocked with both rainbow and brown trout, and it was possible to hire a guide to teach you the technique, as well as to take you out on a trip. A number of small towns, such as Adaminibi, had indeed built a small tourist sector out of fly fishing and even hosted a world fly fishing tournament a number of years ago. 
Scouring the internet, I came across Paul Bourne and his company, Snowy Monaro Fishing. And after a number of emails back and forward, we decided to book a two-day guided fishing trip, so we had plenty of time to learn the ropes and try our hand at fishing the upper reaches of the Murrumbidgee River in the Kosciuszko National Park. It was mid-autumn and we were coming soon to the spawning season for trout, which in the Southern Hemisphere generally starts in May. So the window was fast closing, but work obligations meant we had to take our chances. The first morning up at altitude found us being fitted with wetsuit lined waders that were meant to insulate our legs and feet as well as keep them dry from the bitingly cold water. Over these we put on special felt lined wading boots that made walking over the rocky and slippery stream bottoms less risky. We then walked through a paddock to an open area to learn about the specific differences in rod design and reel construction compared to other fishing setups. It was interesting to learn that in Australia everyone apparently has the right to walk along the bank of a named stream and fish it, even if it runs through private property. The rod itself was thinner than most other rods and sectioned into three pieces. The main line was a thick nylon braid, not twine as I had incorrectly assumed all these years, and it was wound over a very simple and small alvey style reel. Two or three increasingly fine half metre lengths of leader were joined end to end and then onto the main line, making for a leader length of about one and a half to two metres. There was no sinker on this rig, the weight of the braid alone and whip actions in the casting process were meant to progressively lengthen the line until you were ready to drop it to the point you chose. The casting method looked simple enough. Paul described the action as a push-pull type of repetitive action coming from the shoulder girdle that directed the line gently to rise behind us at an angle of about 45 degrees and once it unfolded to the end it was meant to be pushed forward again, repeating this action while with the other hand drawing off line from the reel that would be taken up in the next action. However, we soon found that we were prone to flicking our wrist and whipping the line forward too early, and it was some time before we could tolerably control all the different arm joints and variables to affect a fairly smooth line lengthening casting pattern in the air. Once you had lengthened out the line to your satisfaction, you would send it to its destination with a final push. Unlike regular fishing, you don't wind the reel and spool the line back, but instead you draw out an extra length that is held in the other hand and progressively gathered back in as the line floats downstream towards you. Given the fast currents, this became quite a challenge to do quickly as the instinct to wind had to be suppressed. The fast nature of the current meant that the line often floated past us before we had a chance to gather and start a fresh cast, so flicking it forward in a loop was another skill to be learned. As the morning rolled on, we learned about flies and a few of the basic principles involved in their use. Trout fishermen take great pains to manufacture their own flies by tying fur, feathers or other potentially attractive lure materials onto an impossibly tiny hook changing them regularly depending on conditions, fish activity as well as local insect activity. Paul spent as much time observing what bugs and larvae were falling off overhanging branches into the water yep. as he did the potential of the section of stream we were looking to fish in. He chose a fairly sheltered and shallow section of stream to start fishing and it wasn't long before Dad hooked his first fish. In the excitement, his instinct was to wind it in, but we were told that trout are pulled in by hand, the line only wound after the fish was netted.
It was also difficult to hook them. I had learned over many years to suppress the natural instinct to jag at the line as soon as I felt a bite. Dad had always taught me to let the fish catch itself, but the hooks used in regular saltwater fishing, as well as the behaviour of trout, was different, and it required us to now unlearn what we had done over many years and jag as soon as we felt a nibble. Having landed the first fish of the day, the look on Dad's face was pure gold and already worth the cost of the trip. We had plenty of bites, so there was no lack of action. After breaking for lunch, we moved on to a higher altitude and more remote location, and suddenly the first snows of the season began to fall. Walking through tall, thick tussocks of grass, we tried our luck in a narrow and fast-running stream. Standing steadily became ever more challenging and the snow added another dimension to the experience. We had a few bites but by now the afternoon was drawing to a close so we called it a day, retiring to the local returned servicemen's club for a well-earned meal, football on the big screen and a convivial review of the day's action. Next morning we were up at the crack of dawn and off to an even more remote mountain stream where a blanket of snow from the previous day had dusted the ground in a visual treat I hadn't expected to experience. Paul told us that trout are fairly lazy, as well as skittish, and generally don't feed at dawn or dusk, as many saltwater fish do. They generally follow the activity of insects, who are often busy during the sunniest and warmest parts of the day. We were soon walking to new spots along the Murrumbidgee, trying to avoid falling into gaping wombat holes and rabbit burrows, of which there were many. This makes for a very real risk of fracture or sprain, and I could see Dad was concerned about falling. The grass was quite high and thick in most places, and given the remote location, I dare say I'd be reluctant to walk through so much scrub in the middle of summer when snakes abound out here. Anyway, we were soon fishing again and Dad pulled in another rainbow and then I did as well. Having racked up a few, we began to wonder if we might catch a brown trout, which Paul said were more skittish and shy compared to the rainbows who tended to be more aggressive and adventurous. The trick was to cast far enough ahead following the line of bubble foam that naturally coursed downstream and to do it in one go so as not to frighten the fish with lots of failed attempts disturbing the water and alerting them to our presence. By now, we had been casting for a day and a half and the repetitive shoulder action was beginning to make itself felt. So we took turns to rest and at one point asked Paul to take over so we could just watch in awe to see how a master did it. 
It truly is an art to behold, as he effortlessly whipped the line overhead multiple times, then landed it with pinpoint accuracy 20, even 30 meters or so ahead, with no sinker for help. Dad asked him if he ever used bait when fishing for trout, and the look of disgust on Paul's face was priceless, as anyone who has ever raised the subject with a fly fisherman knows. He then gave us a lengthy lecture on the superiority of fly fishing over all other human endeavours, for which no contest was entertained. Part of the art of fly fishing is in the building and choosing of the fly itself, and the more I thought about it, the more respect I had for those fishermen who have made this style of fishing their personal passion. Anyway, as the afternoon wore on, I finally caught an elusive brown, which to me seemed an even more beautiful and delicate creature than the rainbow. Another couple of rainbows followed and I could see on Dad's face by the middle of the afternoon that fatigue was starting to set in and the cold was also beginning to bite. Paul had lived up to his word and given us a fishing experience to remember. Not that we caught any whoppers, but to finally get to experience the gentleman's fishing art in the pristine remote wilderness with my dad and landing a few was a real treat and will remain with me for a long time. Thoroughly sore and exhausted, we slowly made the long trip back to town, passing the occasional iconic herd of wild snowy mountain brumbies. We eventually made our way to the local pub, debriefing the day's excitement over an honest dinner and a couple of schooners. As the weekend slowly wound to a close and the busyness of our minds similarly unwound, the conversation meandered back and forward like the streams we had just fished in, with Dad sharing pearls of wisdom and Huckleberry Finn stories from his boyhood, some I hadn't heard before, others at least a hundred times. The trip home included astute and wide-ranging observations about fishing, manhood, fatherhood, and even possibly the meaning of life all punctuated by long periods of silence, which was just fine too. I don't think we solved any of the world's pressing problems, nor found a cure for any disease, perhaps with the exception of stress, but I'm sure that making some time to spend away with my dad did us both good in ways that are, at the same time, intangible yet obvious. Will we go trout fishing again? Not sure. Dad remarked at one point, thigh deep in water and sore shouldered as he handed me the rod, this is all really nice, but I like the kind of fishing that I can cast my line in, light a cigarette and relax. I certainly couldn't argue with that, but who knows, maybe someday my son or daughter might want to go trout fishing, in which case I'll have plenty of stories of my own to share. Till next time, walk tall. Cheers.